Um, our next presentation is the Club of the Year Award winner. And this is the Vienna Wireless Society. And Bill, W2 Whiskey Charlie Mike, uh, the floor is yours and we look forward to your presentation. Congratulations, Bill, and all the club members of Vienna Wireless. Well, thanks, Tim. Uh, let me see if I can get this presentation going and we can uh, tell you a little bit about Vienna Wireless. What an act to follow. <laughs> Um, I, I can't even uh, imagine trying to, to uh, follow that, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I would just like to uh, say a couple of things to start with. First of all, Tim uh, and everyone involved with Hamvention, we are extremely happy and honored to be uh, here and to be one of over 2,700 ARL clubs and to have been uh, selected as Amateur Radio Club of the Year for 2021. You know, there are a lot of clubs out there and in, in some way or another, every one of them is club of the year at one point or another. Uh, we are also uh, particularly humbled to be among these award winners. Uh, for those of you who just watched uh, Tamitha and Wes, and then you'll, you're going to see uh, Angel uh, in a little while. It, this is an incredible honor and uh, frankly, I'm very um, humbled by it all. So um, let me tell you that I'd like to start by, uh, by talking a little bit about uh, one of the greatest 20th century philosophers, uh, Yogi Berra, who once said, amateur radio is 90% people and the other half is technical. And the reason that uh, that's important, um, forgive me, Yogi, wherever you are for having uh, co-opted your phrase, but uh, that's important because clubs are made up of people and that's what makes us special. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, Vienna Wireless Society, which began in 1963. So in 1963, uh, the Beatles hadn't um, even come to the US. The price of gasoline was a lot cheaper than now. The price of a first class stamp had just gone up to five cents. Uh, it was the year of uh, social change because that was the year that Martin Luther King Jr. gave the I Have a Dream speech in uh, Washington. And the Collins KWM2A was 1250 dollars, which is just under $11,000 today, about the same as a high quality transceiver today. Top of the line transceiver today is about that price. And Vienna, Virginia was just a sleepy suburb of Washington. In fact, it was so sleepy that there was a railroad that had a grade crossing across the main street in Vienna. That's the Maple Avenue, the main, uh, main street through the center of town. And uh, several times a day, traffic had to stop for a train. Uh, that's changed. Now that's what that grade crossing looks like. It's now a bike trail. And this is just a slow part of the traffic day here. Anyhow, uh, Vienna is located uh, west of Washington, as you can see on this map outside the the current Beltway, but in 1963, the Beltway wasn't even completed yet. And Vienna was a, a, a suburb that was fairly isolated. There were other settlements, if you will, in the area, but it was surrounded by forest. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's not, not far from here to Tyson's Corner, Virginia, which is uh, the largest unincorporated city in the country now. But in 1963, it was just a crossroads. So there were some hams in the area who uh, were pretty enthusiastic about getting together. And again, it's about people. They wanted to start their own club, even though there were other clubs around. And they uh, uh, decided that they wanted to do this because of several reasons. One of them was social and the other was they wanted to expand their knowledge of amateur radio. So if you want to do that, how do you do that? Well, there was no internet. There were no cell phones. There were no online listings of a licensed amateur radio operators. So they went to the best thing they had, which is called the call book. Now, uh, many of you know this, but just in case uh, there are some who don't, uh, a publication used to come out every year called the Amateur Radio Call Book, and it had listings of every radio amateur in the country and some information like their address and their call sign. So a couple of folks in Vienna went through the call book in 1963 through the uh, fourth call area section. And they were searching for every radio operator who had a Vienna address. They found dozens and they sent out a bunch of postcards, dozens and dozens of postcards. 
inviting these hams to an organizational meeting for a radio club. And that organizational meeting occurred here in the Vienna Town Hall. And I'll digress and point out that this is Virginia, and uh, Virginia is sometimes called the Old Dominion, loves old stuff. Uh, so the town was actually settled in 1754. And in 1963, this building, which was the, uh, still is the town hall, uh, housed everything, the mayor's office, the town council, police station, and for a short while at least, the amateur radio club. These two people are important because they were the ones that were going through the call book, listing the names and sending out the postcards. This is Ray and Joan Johnson. Ray is K5RJ, Joan is K4JRJ. And they, uh, they are an interesting couple. As you can see, uh, Ray proposed to Joan by asking her if she would be his XYL. And I found out that shortly after they got married, Joan, who wasn't an amateur radio operator at the time, studied uh, in secret to get her license and presented her license to Ray as a Christmas present. Now, Ray is a DX operator of some note. Um, he's one of those guys who has worked them all. And when I say worked them all, I mean worked them all. He has worked every DXCC entity, including Spratly Islands, Bouvet, Crozet, and indeed North Korea. So here's his QSL card from a 2002 contact with a relatively brief de expedition that was in North Korea. Um, frankly, I've never seen one of these except this one that uh, of Ray's. They, I don't think there are many of these around. So they got started with the club and they got some publicity in the local newspaper. And um, Joan had the idea that if we offered food, that uh, people might come and be a little bit more sociable and stay around a little bit longer. So sure enough, there was food at the very first meeting which means that, <laughs> that food is in the DNA of Vienna Wireless Society, and it's part of our story all along. By the way, I'm going to be sharing just bits of our story here and maybe pose a couple of questions at the end. Um, and we, had, we did not invent, by the way, the uh, phrase calories per QSO, but we are big subscribers and supporters of that idea. So the club had uh, been around less than six months when field day rolled around in 1963. Uh, the club had grown in membership a little bit. And uh, so the, the club went out to a local uh, park in the town and using some old World War II Army tarpaulins, they set up a station. Now they had taken the precaution of talking to the authorities in the town, including the police ahead of time to alert them to this uh, endeavor. And they, they were gonna be operating all weekend long, including through the night. And uh, so they got approval. Everybody was happy with that, but they didn't count on one thing, a generator. Now we all know that the generators that we use today are quiet. You can, as Ray says, you can sit on them and have a conversation, but that wasn't true for this generator in 1963. So unfortunately about 2 a.m., the police showed up and said, hmm, there's a lot of noise here and the neighbors are complaining, so we need to ask you to stop. So that generator shut down the first Vienna Wireless Society field day effort in the middle of the night. By the way, uh, that, that effort netted about 2,200 points in the uh, scoring system of the, of the time. Um, our latest field day effort in person was in 2019, obviously, and um, and we had about 15,000 points in that uh, uh, scoring system. And that put us in third place in our category. And uh, if we'd had that 15 more points, we would have been in second place. So let me talk ab about a few of our service oriented activities in the club, uh, Christmas messages, some the spook watch. I'll talk about each of these, by the way, uh, amateur radio oriented scholarships, the Marine Corps marathon, Halloween parade in the town, the turkey trot, the estate team, and some emergency communications activities. So in the 60s, you may recall that there were no cell phones, there was no email, uh, long distance phone calls could be quite expensive. So the club went out to the then newly established Tyson's Corner Shopping Center and set up a station over the holidays and they allowed people to give them messages which they would 
they would um, pass on to relatives all over the U.S. using amateur radio for free. So this is one of our first service projects from the club. Then there's the spook watch. Now, these two gentlemen are using our new repeater back in the 60s again to extend the eyes and ears of the local authorities to make sure nobody stole anybody's candy and to make sure that all the ghosts were friendly ghosts. We also uh, started uh, funding some amateur radio oriented scholarships. And the reason this key is there is because A, CW operators love bugs and keys, and B, that's the, uh, that's the first picture you see when you go to the Foundation for Amateur Radio website. Uh, they were, uh, the, that was the vehicle that we used to fund amateur radio scholarships. Now, I'll stop here for a moment and say that the, the, the story of the Vienna Wireless Society is not a straight line. We've had our ups and downs. In the 1990s, there was a period where the uh, income was getting uh, less and expenses were still high. And the leadership of the club at the time said, we need to cut back on some of our expenses. Now, we were in no way uh, uh, threatened with extinction, but the leadership decided we need to cut back on some expenses. So we uh, stopped our funding of amateur radio scholarships, which is something we hope to restart again soon. Marine Corps Marathon, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the People's Marathon. And you can see that there are over 30,000 people in the last several years that the marathon was run. Um, takes a while to get them all started. But anyhow, uh, the, the marathon gets a lot of support from the amateur radio community in several ways. And one way is that the course is um, manned by 150 radio amateurs, give or take. Every medical aid station, every water point, and most mile markers and half mile markers are, are established with amateur radio operators present to communicate and to, again, increase the presence and the uh, eyes and ears of the, uh, the organizers of the marathon. But what our society, our, the Vienna Wireless Society, has been involved in for the last 20 years is in the response. We've had the responsibility for establishing the medical communications network. Now, the medical communications network is extremely important. They need to track every medical event throughout the race. Here are some VWS volunteers setting up a repeater on a, on a building in, in the middle of the course. Here's an antenna overlooking the Pentagon. Sometimes I get antsy about that. And here is the medical mar uh, marathon medical communications tent from uh, 2019. See the antennas there, but inside the tent, you can see there are several stations. We need to set up redundant uh, systems because it's very important for the top doc and other medical people to have a reliable communication system to track every medical event during the race and to, to build a database and keep records for it. So again, that's been our responsibility for the last 20 years, although not last year. Unfortunately, last year, the Marine Corps Marathon was canceled due to COVID. This is a, a picture of one of the typical aid stations along the route of the course, and that's the amateur uh, radio station uh, set up behind it there under the blue tarp. Some other radio activities that we've uh, particip participated in over the years include things like Field Day, Winterfest, that's our ham fest, balloon launches, they're kind of fun, uh, contacts with the space station, contesting, some special event stations and uh, repeaters, as well as our nets each week. So here's 2019's VHF GOTA tent with uh, the uh, CERT team uh, sharing our space. We are big supporters and deeply involved with the Fairfax County uh, Community Emergency Response Team, the CERT team. Uh, we provide licensing classes, uh, licensing exams, and we co-opt the new, newly licensed amateurs and try and get them involved in the club so that we can get them more invested in amateur radio and, and get them uh, more knowledgeable and perhaps uh, take a bigger role in amateur radio than they would if they just took the CERT test and, and passed. So field day 2019, again, this is a picture of a hex beam. We usually set up, oh, 
two hex beams, a spider beam, several moxons, and some dipoles. But the reason I'm showing you this picture actually is because of that food tent in the background. That striped tent is the food tent. And don't forget I said that food is in the DNA of this club. Here we are setting up that, uh, that hex beam antenna. As you can see, a bunch of radio amateurs standing around watching one guy work. That guy in the middle is doing all the work. That young ham is uh, Jacob Brunner, who is now off at Michigan State University, where he is president of his amateur radio club. Uh, remember this photo. Did I mention that we love to eat? Uh, this is how we get people to come out to field day. Now, this is a picture of uh, actual operations during field day with two guys sitting in the 40-meter sideband tent. Turns out that these two gentlemen are now the president and vice president of our club. Uh, on the left is um, Andrew, K3NHT. And the other gentleman who's actually doing the operating there is Dean, KK4DAS. Um, looks pretty relaxed. I think they're waiting for lunch. So Winterfest, Winterfest is our ham fest, which is until last year was, uh, was occurred every year in the spring or late winter since the early 70s. And we have as many ham fests do a broad range of activities, including lots of boat anchors and a new Arden network station set up in the background there. We also have a tailgating area, which is nothing like uh, hamvention, but it's not bad. And I want to show you this photo because this gentleman who's sitting there holding on to the, uh, uh, the signal link uh, box, uh, Chris Ramsey's now silent key, N4YE, a very active member of Vienna Wireless, was president of the local QCWA Chapter 91, the Vic Clark chapter. And by the way, Vic Clark was president of the AWRL, AWRL for a number of years and was an honorary member of VWS, as, was, as were some other hams like uh, Barry Goldwater, K7UGA. Now, Chris passed away last year, and the uh, estate team is, has taken care of his um, uh, equipment, his station, and taken down his antennas, taking care of the paperwork so that his wife and children did not have to deal with that along with the loss of Chris. One of the best CW operators you'll ever meet. Balloon launches. Now, we did a total of eight balloon launches in our career as a balloon launching club. This one's from December of 2006. Now, the balloon's all ready to go. The package is all set and everything's set up. This was a family event, however, and so these girls were the ones that actually launched the balloon. They're holding on to the line, and they let go, and there goes a the balloon. Now, on its way up, it was taking some pictures. This is from the one on the left is about five or 6,000 feet looking down. And that green balloon has a story behind it. It was suspended from the uh, uh, underneath the balloon and it was full of peeponauts. What are peeponauts? Well, peeponauts are little uh, candies, the peeps that we often see at Easter time, little baby chickens with parachutes on them that the kids had made and a little note saying, if found, please call this number. And the idea, of course, was that it, when that balloon would reach a certain altitude, it would burst and the peeponauts would float to the ground. And hopefully, these little girls would hear from the people that found them. Sadly, uh, no one ever called. And the picture on the right is a picture taken near the apogee of this particular launch, just over 100,000 feet. Well, the balloon burst and the, and the uh, package came down. Luckily, we were tracking it through APRS and uh, our team found it fairly quickly. There it is suspended from the tree and there's the package. You can see the, the hole for the, the uh, horizontal camera there. And here's a picture of a different package, but just to show you what's, what it looked like inside. We also labeled it clearly so that no one would think they were being invaded by space aliens, that this was indeed a harmless amateur radio experiment. Now there's another part of the balloon launch story for us. The last balloon that we launched, number eight, which was after this one in 2006, when it started down, it sort of, it came down slowly and it sadly floated right through the approach path of Washington National Airport. Now that's not a good thing. And in fact, it was sighted by an airline crew on their approach to Washington National Airport. They call the FAA and the next thing you know, Vienna Wireless Society has a letter of reprimand in its file at the Federal Aviation Administration 
That was our last balloon launch. The space station. Well, we've been lucky because of a couple of things, but one of them is that it turns out that a local school had children, uh, elementary school had children in it whose parents were friends with one of the astronauts that was on the space station in 2007. So they wanted to have a, a contact with, the, with this astronaut. She was a licensed amateur radio operator, and they thought that it would be really cool if the, she could have a conversation with children at an elementary school. And so they reached out to us, to Vienna Wireless Society, to do this. And we set up a station at Virginia Run Elementary School that included three antennas and two radio stations because we wanted to have redundancy and make sure that this could happen. It was scheduled, and uh, the kids all had, the ones that wanted to contact the space station had their questions written out, and uh, they read them and got answers from the space station from uh, the astronaut, Sonny Williams. Now, here is a picture of a girl asking a great question, I thought, and it's all in the inset. You can see a picture of the antenna that we were using, a beam antenna that was uh, tracking both uh, uh, in azimuth and elevation, the station as it transited from horizon to horizon. So Sonny Williams was using the call sign November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra to contact K4HTA. And here's Sonny in the space station. I don't think she's operating at this moment, but there's a picture of her while she was uh, on the crew of the space station. Contesting is something that we really enjoy doing, especially if we can make it a social event. And don't forget, there's going to be food involved. Uh, before COVID, we would operate uh, at least six, in six to seven contests every year. We operated typically every NAQP, RIDI, Sideband, and uh, CW, both the summer and winter edition. And uh, we would get together, establish several stations at somebody's home, and the club members would, would come through as the day uh, progressed and operate. So it got us a chance to, 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 to have a, a practicum in operating and a chance for us to spend some time together and of course to eat. Now this picture is interesting because the guy in the foreground is another blind ham, John Bailey. Lynn, W4DDT is the operator there and Lynn came to the club because she wanted to learn Morse code. She wanted to learn CW, and so she uh, reached out to the club thinking that we might be able to help her, and sure enough, we did, and now she's a licensed radio operator and is an active member of our club. The other gentleman is uh, Mark in 4ET, and that's his granddaughter there, a future ham. Another uh, one of our members operating is uh, Yasik, KW4EP, an in incredibly brilliant electrical engineer. He's also our videographer, and if you go to our website, you can find virtually all of our uh, programs, our club programs are archived there. And a lot of those were done by Yasik. And here he is operating in one of the NAQP sessions in 2019. Speaking of contesting, one of our members, John, KM4KMU, uh, loves VHF contesting, particularly mobile. Now, he got this Jeep, I think, through somewhat nefarious methods. It was part of a, uh, I think it was part of a confiscated group of equipment from the Southwest by the Drug Enforcement Administration. It had been involved with some uh, untoward activities like drug running. And he got it, made some modifications to it, and started building a, an amateur radio station inside it and some uh, antennas on top of it. He did all this work himself because he wanted to be able to drive out to a high point somewhere near here and operate in VHF and UHF contests. So that's what it looks like when it's on the road. And this is what that uh, Jeep looks like when he's got all the antennas up. A lot of Yaggies. He operates a largely FM, but some sideband on two meters and uh, up and some six meter activity. And he has actually done fairly well in contesting. He has won a couple of, uh, of ARRL contests in the FM only band, or FM only contest category. And there's John Hart at work inside. Uh, I think this is before he installed his rotator. So his, he had an Armstrong rotator. He would just reach over there and turn the mast to, uh, to change the direction of his beam antenna. Now, we like special events. Um, 
to, uh, we like them for several reasons. One of them is that it gives members an opportunity to work pileups, to practice their uh, DX uh, contesting skills, and just generally to learn more about amateur radio. Now, our two most recent ones, we, we usually do one every two years or so, but our two most recent ones were these. Uh, Whiskey for Victor celebrated the 55th anniversary of the founding of our club, and those are, those are some scenes from around the town of Vienna there. Then our most recent one was in December of 2020, Whiskey for Foxtrot. And that was to celebrate the 120th anniversary of Reginald Fessenden's first contact, voice contact by wireless, which actually occurred on Cobb Island in the Potomac River, not far south from where we are now. It was quite a milestone and we celebrated that last December. So we enjoy several nets each week. Um, the two meter net and the 10 meter net are the most, most exciting ones, I think. Uh, the two meter net occurs on Monday nights and because we are able to use our newly relocated and upgraded repeater, we now have um, echo link capabilities. So we have people who participate from all over the country. The 10 meter net or sometimes called the powwow net has been in uh, existence for almost the entire life of the club. It started out as a nightly net, but now it's a weekly net and uh, it has participation that has grown dramatically over the last few years. Like Wes said, I, we think at least partly that's because of COVID. But we also have two different digital nets, including a new one for newcomers called the Wild and Wacky Digital Net and a CW Practice Net. Some of our educational activities over the years include club programs, the forum, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, the scouting activities, Saturday morning classes, our website, which is a community resource uh, because of all of the uh, for, uh, sorry, all of the programs that are, that are archived there. Uh, the Virginia Section Convention, which is held every year at Winterfest or this year virtually, as well as shack crawls. And I'll tell you about those as well. So club programs, we have two meetings a month and we have uh, programs every, uh, at every one of those meetings. We've, I, I couldn't begin to list, to list all of the programs and all of the speakers that we've had in the last year or year and a half. But of course, the, the silver lining in the COVID crisis is that we've been able to get people from uh, far distant locations to talk to us, like Roy Llewellyn, who is the inventor of EasyNick software, talking to us about antennas. Bob Heil, and you can imagine that was an incredible experience. We even got to hear Bob uh, play the organ. Tom Medlin, the balloon guy, Pico Balloons, and uh, we learned a lot about what his work has been in uh, balloons, very different from the balloons that we launched. And our own Leon Bruner, NTAB, who uh, gave us a program on what's a decibel, and it was, uh, it was remarkable because it made uh, something that seemed complex to many of us so simple that even I could understand it. And all of these programs, of course, are available at ViennaWireless.net, our website. Now, the forum, I told you I would tell you about this. A few years ago, it became clear to us that if we wanted to welcome new members into the hobby, we needed to help them understand a little bit more about amateur radio. You know, we, we amateurs have a, a, a language that's almost our own, and there's a lot of concepts which seem basic to many amateur radio operators, which are brand new to people that are new in the hobby. So before each meeting, we have a, what I think of as the uh, pre-game show and we for a half an hour we talk about some some uh, topic that has to do with newly licensed amateurs and welcoming them into the hobby and here's a list of topics for just a few examples scouts we've been uh, involved in scouts in the past uh, with radio amateur licensing classes and testing We've helped many scouts get their radio merit badge and interpreter strip. Uh, I was not aware of this, but uh, scouts are eligible to get an interpreter strip for any foreign language that they master. And Morse code, CW, is regarded as a foreign language. So any scout who masters Morse code is eligible for an interpreter strip for Morse code. We did some fox hunting with them, which they loved, and uh, they participate in field day. So for example, here is field day where some scouts are setting up a hex beam antenna. 
Now you'll notice that in this uh, uh, photo, there are scouts that are hard at work all around the, the antenna setup process. Unlike that previous photo where the adults were standing around watching one guy work, all of these scouts are engaged. Speaking of being engaged, look at the intensity on these two scouts faces as they're operating a, a station. And I'm not sure which one it is, but it's one of our field day stations that they set up and operated themselves. Licensing classes. Uh, oh, actually, that's not what that's not what they look like. They look like this. The uh, the scouts are pretty intense in and uh, very dedicated learners. There are even some adults there who are actually paying attention to these licensing classes. And we've helped quite a few scouting adults learn, earn their amateur radio license as well. Saturday morning classes. Now, some of you are maybe old enough like I am to remember when we had Saturday morning classes in school. Could ruin a Friday night for you. Uh, but anyhow, we had Saturday morning classes before COVID, and since then, we've had several of them online, uh, virtual, including a, a class on grounding and binding your station, something that's critically important to amateurs and not often not well appreciated. We had one of the things that I think is most exciting was our extra class upgrade uh, classes, a set of classes. There were 10 weeks in a row where a group of dedicated amateurs who wanted to earn their ex extra class license and not just learn to pass the test, but actually understand the material, spent Saturday morning for 10 weeks in a row uh, to uh, participate in classes that were taught by VWS members and all 10 of them passed their licensing exam. A couple of other, uh, couple of other topics there, but there were many more. The contesting software uh, operation class was uh, to help us all be able to participate in distributed um, contesting, which we've done for the last year, like many clubs. Oops, let me go back to that. The shack crawls that we, we, uh, we've had some people who have um, led us through sh several shack crawls to show new hams, the, the entire variety, the whole plethora of ways to set up an amateur radio shack. This is a simple one. And here's a much more thorough, complicated one. As you can see, we have some amateurs who, who are deeply ingrained in boat anchors, which are beautiful things. Some other fun activities that we've been part of are the QLF contest, fox hunts, which we still do from time to time, because uh, you can do those during the time of COVID with no problem. The maker team, I'll talk about that in a minute, and the antenna team. So we have uh, Pete, the guy in the red plaid shirt, is a master woodworker, and we have him as a club resource in many ways. He has a wonderful work workshop in his basement, and he made this straight key solely for the purpose of having a contest on how to send Morse code with your left foot. So all the, all the people that wanted to participate had to send a standard message with their left foot, which was graded by the gentleman on the right, I tried it and I have to tell you that it was much harder than I thought and I didn't do very well. And it turns out that the gentleman who won the prize for the best performance was left-handed, sort of like cheating. That's kind of like having an, an, an amplifier. Okay, the maker team. The maker team, by the way, was recently uh, featured on Solder Smoke, a national blog on making homebrew equipment. And this is a couple of pit photos showing what they're working on now. They are currently building a single sideband QRP transceiver, and they're building it from a schematics and not from a kit. So sort of like from scratch. And as a result, uh, they look a little different. There's the audio amplifier on the left for one of the participants uh, uh, rig. And there's a, a larger uh, conglomeration of components for another rig on the right. And one of our uh, maker team uh, participants is also a master machinist, and he put together a beautiful faceplate for his rig, including milling those knobs. There's a completed panel. So we have an antenna team. Now, the antenna team is an interesting, interesting um, group because what they do is they go out and put up antennas for new hams. And the deal is that if they put up a help put up an antenna for you, you have to then join the antenna team 
and pay it forward and work on the next installation. Um, so this is a way to get amateurs involved in service work, even though it's within the club or within the amateur radio community, I should say. Um, that was a, a home-built uh, 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 launcher there that that gentleman is using. And of course, sometimes you can't tell exactly how much pressure to put in one of those. So this is a classic antenna team pose. Where the heck did that thing go? Public service and emergency communications, again, a part of our club because we, are, we want to be as involved in emergency and uh, especially public service work as we can. It's too bad that my colleague Brendan O'Neill is not here. He was called away to work and won't be able to participate, but he, he could do a much better job of explaining this stuff. But he, um, he is uh, the ARIES uh, uh, emergency coordinator for Fairfax County, an AWRL position. He's also one of the assistant emergency coordinators for the Virginia section. And uh, he, that's him in the middle there shaking hands with Pete, the QR, QLF guy. This is the team on uh, th uh, a Thanksgiving morning where we were participating in a local high school's uh, fundraiser by increasing the eyes and ears of authorities along the race course for the turkey trot. 22 degrees, 7 o'clock in the morning. These are dedicated hams. And Brendan has put together an extremely uh, uh, impressive go kit. We find that new members that come into the club, from, especially through the CERT process, are very interested in uh, emergency communications and go kits are uh, a very essential part of that. So here's Brendan's go kit with uh, HF, VHF, UHF, back tour, and a whole bunch of other things all in a, in a kit that he has used many times. And the, these go kits are a central part of maintaining a, a capacity for emer emergency communications. Speaking of emergency communications, we relocated within the last year, our two meter repeater to the top of the Capital One building which is uh, I think the fourth tallest building in the, in the state of Virginia. It's located on Tyson's Corner. And here is the new antenna and the new repeater in what they call the penthouse on the top of that building. There's the insulation team. Here's some details about that repeater. The thing that's most interesting to me is that it has now allowed us to expand our reach through Echolink and AllStar. So as I said earlier, we have people now that participate in our nets and who use the repeater who are located all over the country, in fact, all over the world through Echolink. Now, because the repeater was, uh, has such a large footprint, it covers the entire Washington, D.C. area now. It, uh, we were asked by the Department of Homes, Homeland Security to uh, provide additional coverage, security coverage for the presidential inauguration in uh, January. Um, so that we were able to monitor frequencies and to monitor the, uh, the area around Washington, D.C. with uh, mobile operators and provide information to the security team. Now, this last statement is interesting to me, but what it essentially means is that through OXCOM, we are able to, to with synergy, to um, increase the communication uh, capabilities of local authorities with amateur radio. So the Virginia Section Convention. Now, I mentioned earlier that at our Winterfest Ham Fest, that's when the, the convention normally meets. But for the last two years, we've not been able to hold Winterfest due to COVID. So just uh, this past uh, March, we, or sorry, April, we had the online version of a section convention where we tried to uh, offer different educational opportunities, different forums in three different tracks one for new and rusty hams, a hot topics, which included how do you increase your inclusivity in amateur radio, where we got to hear from people like Melissa Poor, who was the teacher, the Carol Perry Teacher of the Year uh, last year at Orlando's Hamcation, and Kathleen Lamont, who is the um, uh, educational coordinator for the International uh, ARIS, the Amateur Radio and International Space Station effort as well as, of course, a whole bunch of topics having to do with uh, amateur radio emergency service and OXCOM. This was pretty well attended, 
Uh, and the ARRL was one of our sponsors, along with a whole range of uh, amateur radio um, vendors. So I've avoided having a chart until now because I didn't want to bore you. I don't like, I don't like, uh, personally, don't like um, presentations where there's just a series of charts to stare at. But I thought I'd throw in a few like this one, which describes my college experience. And then this one, which I think many of us can relate to. Um, certainly, it, it, it applies to me. The chance of me screwing up are vastly increased if anyone's watching. But here's a real chart. So this is the Vigne Vien Virginia Wireless, sorry, Vienna Wireless Society's membership growth. And the teams, we were getting about two new members a month. But starting in 2019, we've started averaging about five or six new members a month. And so our uh, me total membership has increased by about 60 or so people in the last couple of years. And uh, that means we're up to about 285 members. Now, remember this chart as I go, uh, go along here, because I'll tell you something more about it later. The membership of the club is uh, largely uh, uh, extra class members, about half. And I think this is due largely to our effort to get people deeply involved in amateur radio. We try to get them in the club, get them engaged with the, with the hobby and get them engaged with the process of amateur radio and the club. And that way they are able, to, if, as they study for the extra class exams, the general class, extra class exams, they get to be more involved and more capable of enjoying the hobby. So this is another way to look at that same chart gives you a feel for just how many of uh, our, our members are extra class. This is probably true for a lot of clubs, but it's certainly true for us. Our members are also widespread. They're in 14 states, including the district and several foreign countries. Uh, and because again, because of Echolink, uh, we are now having them, a lot of them participate in our nets. This chart is about are the, the changing membership of Vienna Wireless Society. Now, what it says is that from 1963, when we were established up until about 2001, 33 of the, of the members that came on board during that time are still members of the club. A lot of them have moved on either uh, to a different area. Some of them are past presidents of the club who get lifetime membership. But since that time, a lot of the members that joined have stayed with the club. And what that means is, that we are a club in transition. We are a club that's transitioning from uh, older members, not just old in terms of age, but old in terms of their, their picture and their enjoyment of the amateur radio to newer members whose interest areas are vastly more uh, modern, vastly more exciting and vastly more um, on the cutting edge of radio communications. So, as I said, we're a club in transition and we'd like to pose a couple of questions to you and to ourselves. First, how do we keep Ram, ham radio relevant given our diversity? And when I say diversity, I don't mean just cultural, racial, or gender, gender diversity. I mean diversity in terms of the interests of the hams that we, that we have in the club or that are in our community, or for that matter, in amateur radio writ large. That diverse, that, uh, those interests are changing dramatically over time, and it's reflected, for example, in the dramatic growth in modes like uh, FT8 and FT4. So how do we keep ham radio relevant? And another question, a related question is, how do we keep amateur radio clubs viable and exciting for the next 50 years? Now, we believe that the clubs are a key part of amateur radio and its uh, growth over the years. And particularly because we know we are given a gift. We're given a gift of these amateur radio frequencies, which we can use for our enjoyment and also for public service. And if we're going, if we're going to pay back that gift through public service, it is much uh, easier to do that through a group of amateurs like in a club than it is for Im individual amateurs to, to uh, do public service opportunities using our radio skills. So that, for that reason, amateur radio clubs need to be a big part of the future of amateur radio. And how do we keep that? How do we keep that going? So uh, another Yogi Berra quote. Yogi once said, 
they, they, no one goes there anymore because the lines are too long. And he also said, you can't have a conversation there because everybody's talking all the time. Well, the second quote is about pileups. And the first quote we hope is not about amateur radio or amateur radio clubs. We are always open to new members. We, we, we strive to get amateurs involved. As I said, we strive to get them engaged fully in the hobby and to get them involved in public service opportunities. We are really grateful to have been part of the amateur radio awards program from the awards committee at Hamvention this year. And we hope to use this as a challenge to increase our service to amateur radio and the community at large. So thank you, thank you, Tim. Thank you, uh, the awards committee for Hamvention and thanks everybody for listening. On behalf of uh, the 285 members of the Vienna Wireless Society, we're very grateful. And if you have answers to those questions or any questions for us or want to pass on what your club is doing, please let me know. Uh, again, I am Bill Mims, call sign Whiskey2, Whiskey Charlie Mike, and that's my email at the bottom there. So please come see us, let us know, and thanks again. Great presentation, Bill, and uh, just a tremendous club and uh, so much to be thankful for, for all, all your members and uh, so very proud that uh, you're the 2021 Club of the Year for Hamvention. And um, I think the awards committee uh, at Hamvention picked a great organization. Uh, Bill, what's the future look like uh, for the Vienna Wireless Society? What, what are you guys working on? What's, what's upcoming? Wow, that's a great question. And uh, I can tell you there are several things. I mentioned already a couple, like trying to get back involved in scholarships. Uh, we're, we're trying to increase our, uh, our involvement in the community in a number of ways. But we're, we're also, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have done that. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're also uh, engaged in new modes. We're trying to increase our educational responsibilities to uh, larger uh, groups. We are... Um, uh, hopeful that the maker team will take off and that we'll be doing more hands-on work down the road. And uh, by and large, we, we'd like to uh, find out what other ham radio clubs are doing and try to learn from them. Well, it sounds like, um, you know, with that large membership like that, do, uh, do most of your members belong to other clubs as well, or do they just belong to VWS? Well, that's a good question. Uh, actually, we have members, uh, quite a few members who are members of the Potomac Valley Radio Club, for example, and several members are members of other radio clubs in the area, but there are quite a few. I'd say the majority of our members are just members of Vienna Wireless. We try to keep everybody occupied and so that their ham radio time is uh, pretty well taken up by our club activities. So um, in-person meetings back before COVID, uh, how many members would come to the in-person meetings every month? That is another great question. Don't forget, <laughs> we serve food. <laughs> so uh, we would have membership uh, uh, attendees at regular meetings. In-person meetings would range between 60 and 70 people, which is interestingly enough about what we get now with our virtual meetings. And uh, so uh, I'm not sure what conclusion you can draw there, but the food had something to do with it. And of course, we are a social group. Um, one of the reasons people join clubs, I think, is because they want to be part of a, a group of folks who share common interests. And as a result, uh, they, the, the club was uh, well uh, blessed with members who like to come to meetings. Now, 60 to 70 is well below what our membership is. I mean, at the present moment, 60 to 70 is uh, less than uh, a third of the members that are active in the club, or at least active in terms of dues paying. But uh, as an amateur radio club, we think that uh, we, we will attract the members that we deserve to have present. And that's what we strive to do with programs and activities. So um, Bill, uh, thinking down the road a little bit, and this is coming sooner than later, um, what are the plans for VWS under once uh, all the COVID restrictions are gone and you're back to in-person, uh, will you have a presence um, on uh, via Zoom, for instance, so, so remote members can be in, or will you just go back to all in-person? Well, another great question, and I wonder how, what other clubs are doing, but it, at the moment, tentatively, 
tentatively our plans to try to find a way to have a hybrid meeting because we do have quite a few people who join us from uh, localities that are not conveniently located to where we are, um, including people who are as far west as Arizona and as far east as Europe. So uh, we hope to be able to do some sort of uh, some sort of hybrid meeting where we have an in-person in -person presence as well. We've also started up just recently at one of our uh, one of our nets I didn't mention, which is our eyeball net. A lot of clubs do this, but we have a Tuesday luncheon. And we have, because of the COVID situation and because most of us are now vaccinated, we've been able to start up that in-person uh, meeting as, or net as well. So that's the answer. We, we're, we, we're not sure, but we hope to be able to have a hybrid presence so that we can have continue to have the members that participate in the club from far away be an integral part of our activities. So Bill, uh, when thinking about uh, the club structure, uh, can you talk about special interest groups or committees? that you have? Sure. Well, our, I mentioned a couple of them. Um, the the uh, special interest groups include a group of people who are working already on our next special event station. Uh, we, are, uh, we have an antenna team and I mentioned th that team before. And I want to say again, that one of, the, one of the interesting things about that is that we get people to pay it forward. If you get an antenna put up by the team, then you need to you'll work on the next antenna installation. By the way, I didn't say this, but they, the antenna team also takes down antennas as they did for the gentleman that I mentioned, uh, Chris Ramsey, or any ham that dies. Uh, we, we try to do as, everything we can to help the family out. So that's another one of our, our groups. We have a, a uh, would you believe it? We have a consignment group. We are now owners, if you will, our, our consignees from a, a huge amount of radio equipment because we've not been able to host our, our ham fest for the last two years. So that's another special group. In fact, there are garages full of amateur radios that'll be available at some point down the road. Uh, we have a, a, a group of people who are uh, again, operated, uh, sorry, not operating, but are engaged in emergency communications. Uh, as I said, that that's an area which attracts a lot of newcomers to amateur radio. And we like to promote that. Uh, for several reasons. One of them is, is a hook to get them in the hobby, but the, the other reason is because it's a great way to provide public service. So those are some of the big um, uh, committees and activities that we're engaged in. Plus, we just like to have a lot of fun. Like people are always coming up with crazy ideas like the QLF contest. So Bill, um, you talked about your involvement with scouts and how BWS integrates with the, the scouts. Uh, do you have any other youth initiatives that are going on? Well, I'll be honest at present, no, we don't. Uh, but that is another area that we're, we're the, the board of directors is clearly engaged in. We'd like to get more involved in STEM education. One of the reasons that we had that track in our uh, section convention uh, program uh, last month was because we wanted to get teachers to te tell us about how we could get more involved in getting amateur radio into schools. And we learned a lot that day and we are trying to follow up by getting some of our members to become uh, uh, authorized to go into schools and, and help teachers, particularly teachers like Kathleen Lamont and Melissa Poor, uh, uh, use amateur radio as a teaching vehicle to get more children engaged with uh, science, technology and engineering. Now that, that's uh, a very, very nice initiative um, and glad to hear that uh, the board is focused on that. And uh, you, you guys have a very nice QRZ page, K4 Hotel Tango Alpha on QRZ. And um, that's where you'll find uh, the link to the website for the club as well, right? Yep, that's it. And it's also easy to remember. It's ViennaWireless.net, one word. You can use ViennaWireless.org. That'll get you there too. And uh, I would invite everybody to go there and give us feedback on that website. Uh, we try to keep it up to date as much as possible. It again has a lot of information. It has all of our, uh, well, not all, but most of our club programs for the last five or six years are archived there in video format. We do have to get permission from the presenter, but we've not run into a problem there. Uh, as well as a whole bunch of other information about our activities and how to get in touch and involved with us. So I would invite everybody to go to viennawireless.net, enjoy the website, and then get back to us and let us know what we need to do to improve it. 
Bill, uh, do you recall your next uh, meeting, uh, who your presenter is? Hmm. No, you okay. caught me there. I don't. I well, can tell I can you. Go that to the website. <laughs> you can go to the website. Yeah. Although it usually doesn't appear until the week before, and our next meeting is not not uh, today, but a week from today. I can tell you that our hope is that we're going to be able to have uh, 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 Alpha Seventy One Alpha Mike Saif present at our club, uh, one of our club meetings in June. So that's something to look forward to. We've got to figure out the logistics because as you know, he's seven hours ahead of us there, but uh, we're trying to figure out a way to do that. Yeah, that's great. Well, Bill, thanks again for uh, coming on today. And it was a great presentation. One of the best club presentations I've ever seen. I know you put a lot of work into it and uh, we were sorry that Brendan couldn't be here today, but um, uh, please extend our appreciation and uh, uh, to Brendan and the rest of the Vienna Wireless Society on a great job. Keep up the good work and and press on. Well, thanks, Tim. I can't tell you how what an honor it is to be part of this. And again, I want to say we we love to learn. We want to use this as a springboard to be a better club. And any, we invite any other clubs out there. Who, uh, who can help us do that to get in touch with us. And again, I'll say, you know, we are one of 2,700 amateur, uh, sorry, ARRL clubs, affiliated clubs, and probably any one of them could be club of the year at one point or another. So again, thanks to Hamvention for giving us this honor. And thanks, Tim, for hosting us today.